I've seen it a billion times. Yeah. I'm just even trying to think of better ways to do it. What a six year old should do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Taught this part of the catechism. <laughs> 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 24 all together. <laughs> and stop. <laughs> Which is pretty good. 24. <laughs> <laughs> that, is that really that? looks like a new Lions Cup. Um, I've had it for a while. Really? It looks shiny. Yeah, well, I haven't really had that many occasions to bring them out. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a new experience for them. So, how many times did they just save the back? How many times have they made it to the NFC Championship game? Correct. In your lifetime? None. In my life. In my lifetime? It's number two. So. Are you from Michigan? I am from Detroit. Are you? Yeah. Pastor Stecker and I grew up about five miles away from each other. Oh, really? We didn't know each other. We did. Yeah. He, went, he went to a different high school. Different school. So, that's. Okay. All right, let's rise for prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Obviously, I'm not Pastor Hoover. He's on his way on a ski trip. It's raining outside. But oh, it's raining snowballs outside. Oh, was that the one it is? Yes. Okay. It's flurry. I think it's going to be an ice ski trip. It'd be a very fun. I hope so. So with that, good time would you turn to page 205 in your catechisms? 205. Um, the third article, part two. Um, so let's, so page 205. And what is the third article? Say that with me. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Say the whole, what does this mean with me? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. God did not create us to live in isolation from one another. Uh, what do people today think about the church? Um, talk about that and then read Acts 2, 42 to 47, and how is the church described there? Take three minutes to do that at your tables. Talk about God didn't create us for isolation. Um, and then what do, you, what do people think about the church today? And then read Acts 2, 42 to 47 when the church began. Go. We actually got to open your Bible to Acts 2. Thank you. 
42 to 47. We have our Bible navigator. And they devoted themselves to So me and you open up a whiskey for you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wouldn't that be something? Hey, we'll get the attention of the lady off. I'll tell you that. All right, in Acts 2.42, um, Luke, who writes this, describes what is happening. What is the church? What are the, name the things that they did. What was the first thing they did? In Luke 2.42. Yes, Carson. Yeah, devoted themselves to what? Yeah, to the teachings. Teachings of who? 
Specifically who? Jesus. What was the next thing? They also did what? Well, what did they call it? The breaking. No, what's the next thing? After the devoted. What does fellowship mean? Just mere by just the definition of the word. What does fellowship mean? We, we do what? We gather together. Like, later on today, in Baltimore and San Francisco, there will be a fellowships going on. <laughs> I mean, it was just a gathering of all these people. Here, it was fellowship around the, uh, the teachings of Christ and the uh, breaking of the bread, which means what? This is a code word for what? Communion. Lord's Supper. And then, what was the last thing? They also gathered together to what? To pray. So this was the, the sign of the church early on, devoted to the teachings of, the, of Jesus. They would gather together as God's people. They would celebrate the Lord's Supper, and they would pray. So that's the definition of the church, per se, very early on in the book of Acts. So even today... Do we devote ourselves to the teaching of Jesus? Yes. Do we fellowship together? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we break the bread? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we pray? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, there we go. So, uh, we have that. Now, right now, as we sit here in the family life room at 9.30 in the morning, are we doing all these? No. No, we're doing three of the four, probably. We done three, we're going to do three of the four. Breaking the bread is what takes place in, in church, the church service itself. So we have that going on. So, you know, many times we have this and this and this primarily as we gather together for Bible study. Things like that. This is in the divine service, in worship itself. All right? Now, on page 205, those, that bold print on the bottom of the page, as Christians we confess that the Holy Spirit has brought us into community we call the church. Gathered in one faith, one mind, and understanding with many different gifts. So, I should seek out those who confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, for they are truly my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, you know, as uh, people get older, they go to college, they go away, and, and I always tell them, if you're going to join a church, make sure that these things are happening that these things are happening. If these things aren't happening, then you might want to question or not you want to be part of that group um, and our understanding of that. Okay, page 206, question 201. Uh, if you've got a highlighter, get it out. Highlight the answer to question 201. What did the Holy Spirit do when he brought me to faith? By means of the law of God, <coughs> the Holy Spirit first convicts me of my sin and then he leads me to repentance so that working through the gospel and the sacraments and the grace the Holy Spirit brings me to faith in Christ and makes me a member of the church. So through the Holy Spirit working through the word of God, first through the law, convicts me of my sin. And then also through that, by the gospel, leads me in repentance saying, oh, I don't want to do that, or I don't want that. I want to follow Jesus. That the gospel calls me, and, and as, as we mentioned last, calls me, gathers, and enlightens the whole Christian church on earth. We're going to talk about that. How the Holy Spirit's job is to bring me to faith and keep me in the faith. Um, and that we have that. So, question number 202. What is the church? It is the body of Christ. That is, all people whom the Spirit, by the means of grace, word, and sacraments, have gathered together uh, in Christ, in faith, throughout the world. So as we gather here right now, the church, also the church universal, and we put it this way, the church universal, we use this word. Oh, Catholic, but we're not Catholic. Well, we're Catholic in this sense, small c. We're not Roman Catholic, large c. We're Catholic, meaning universal. That's what Catholic means, universal. So we're the church Catholic, or the church universal, we're worshiping all the time throughout the world. So as we gather to worship here in New Haven, we have our brothers and sisters all the way around the world, 
at Kenya worshiping at Grace Gavin. Uh, point of Grace. That's what I meant. Point of Grace. We have people worshiping in California, in Canada, South America, Europe, all of that. We all gather around God's word and his sacraments. Um, and we're all doing that. I love it when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We say, there, therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. When we say that, we are not only gathering together with the church in heaven, but we are gathering with the church here on earth. Many different languages, many different peoples, but we are all gathered together. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's God's way, the Holy Spirit's way of gathering us together as a fellowship, hearing the words of Jesus, the God's word, law gospel, and we celebrate the Lord's Supper and we pray. That's what God does. Now, top of page 207, and I talked about this. Catholic means universal. All times, all places. The word church, capital C, refers to all those who believe in Christ. Now, we will say, uh, we, we go to church at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. If I say Emmanuel Lutheran Church, where is Emmanuel Lutheran Church? What's the address? Anybody know the address of Emmanuel Lutheran Church here in New Haven, Indiana? 800 Green Street. So, oh, there it is. Now, as pastors, every once in a while, I'll go visit other churches. So I will go um, to St. Peter's Lutheran Church. That's up on state. I have no idea what the address is. I just know where it is. It's the building. It's the building. Concordia Lutheran Church, the building. Uh, St. Paul downtown, the building, many times. But also, they are the church as meaning that they are gathered and doing those things, gathered around God's word, and that we have that. We also say that we're part of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. That's our church body. That's our denomination. You have the Episcopalian Church. You have the Roman Catholic Church. You have the Methodist Church. Uh, but here, it's a, we can refer to it as a congregation. I mean, as a denomination, as we are together with 6,000 congregations, 2.3 million members, and uh, hopefully growing. Uh, we have that. Uh, now, how is the church different from all other communities? One, as I mentioned, yes, there will be a couple fellowships happening later on today, one in Baltimore, one in San Francisco, but they are not gathered around Jesus' teachings. They're not there to break the bread, Lord's Supper. And there might be a lot of praying going on. <laughs> but, well, whatever. Uh, we have that. So it's a, a community of saints that God has called together, God's <laughs> chosen people, who are you and me. Let us see. Only church is found upon the testimony of Jesus. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations at the end of Matthew 28, you know, he was, he was mandating. He was telling the apostles, now go, teach this. Do these things as you teach others about what I've done. That you would gather together as God's people. That there will be the breaking of the bread. You would celebrate my supper. And that you would pray as well. So we have this as the church that we're doing that. Um, that we are gathered together. And then turn to page 208. Therefore the church is one. The only community in which there is salvation. Where it's gathering of all who believe in Jesus Christ. Who comes to them in his word and sacrament. So we gather together as this fellowship. That we are disciples of Christ. That's why we gather together. Because Jesus called us. The Holy Spirit has called us. So that we can uh, receive these wonderful gifts that God has given to us. And the most important gift that we have received is question 204. What is the forgiveness of sins? Get your highlighter out. Highlight the answer. God's promise that for Christ's sake, he will not hold our many sins against us. When Jesus said from the cross, it is finished, all was paid for, all was accomplished, all sins are forgiven for all people for all time. You don't ever have to think or believe or believe Satan's lies. Oh, Jesus, you've forgiven me all these sins, but this sin you can't forgive me of. Yes, he has. He already has. He already did it on Good Friday. 
And he says, here's your forgiveness over there. I'm not going to hold those sins against you. I'm not going to punish you for those sins. They are forgiven. And God says, and I remember them no more. God will not bring those sins up again. Ever, 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 ever. Now, we're pretty good at sinning, and we like to do the same sin over and over and over again. Jesus still forgives us over and over and over again. Now, he also wants us, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, which you'll get here in a little bit, how the Holy Spirit helps us to not sin again. That the Holy Spirit would like, guide us and lead us. Uh, that we have that. Now, question 205. Why does God forgive our sins? Because he's merciful. Because of what Christ did on the cross. So highlight that. Because God is merciful. He does his forgiveness because we're good people. Because we're not. He forgives us because he's a good God. He's merciful. He's gracious. And he does that because he's because of what Christ did on the cross for you and what he did on the cross for me. Now, I know you talked about this a little bit because I watched a little bit of the video last week. Um, question 206, how is it possible for a just and holy God to declare sinners righteous? Justified, <coughs> justification. This word justification it's a legal term. It's a statement. It's not, you know, it's just God says that you have been justified because of what Christ did. Because what Christ did on the cross, you stand forgiven. And you have received Christ's righteousness. Now, I just did the baptism of uh, Jackson and Jacob uh, Newland. And... Um, why we don't physically do it, spiritually they received it. Um, they received the robe of Christ's righteousness. I baptized them, and Jesus put on them this robe of his righteousness, so that when God the Father looks at Jacob and Jackson, and remember this, when you look at Jacob and Jackson, they are baptized children of God. Are, there gonna, are they going to mess up? Oh, yes. I know Jacob and Jackson. <laughs> Reminds me of somebody. But they are forgiven children of God. Christ has placed upon them his own righteousness so that they stand before God in heaven. They stand in a right standing with the Heavenly Father because of what Jesus did for them. That same robe of righteousness was placed upon you. That when, when God the Father looks at you, he doesn't just see you, he sees his son Jesus. He sees his son Jesus. There will be many people in Baltimore and San Francisco wearing either Raven stuff or Chief stuff or Lion stuff or 49er stuff. And as you're walking along, you're going to go, oh, that's a Lion fan. That's a San Francisco fan. You just know by what they're wearing or what they're not wearing. God looks at you and says, you are mine. You are mine. Like on the front it says, the righteous one. Well, you are righteous in God's eyes because of what Jesus did for you. And it's declared, it's placed upon you. We call it imputed. It's imputed. It is, I like to say, it's been putted on you. But the robe of Christ has been putted on you. You want it, might want to take it off all the time, but what does Jesus do? He puts it back on. He puts it back on. He puts it back on. That we have that. Um, and that we have it. Um, on the bottom there, the note, when our sins were charged to Christ, he suffered fully the penalty for them in our place. He rose again and now lives to all eternity in order to give us his righteousness. Both passive and the act of obedience of Christ, I know Pastor Kluver talked about that, have been credited to us and are receiving through faith. So when God the Father looks at you and he sees you have that robe of Jesus' righteousness on there, he says, ah, you have a right standing with me. Not anything that you did or didn't do is because of what Jesus did for you. That's what that means. Um, so um, that means sins are forgiven. God looks and says, oh, I've forgiven your sins. And anytime we come to him and say, forgive us our sins, we say God is faithful and just and forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what God does. That's what God does. 
that he, he never, he will never take that away from us. Now, question 207, so next page. Where does God offer the forgiveness of sins? In the gospel. The word gospel, and I know I talk about this. In the original language, in the original Greek, that it just means good news, or it can also be translated beautiful news. Beautiful news that we have that. Now, um, of those who are Michigan fans, we received some sad news that our head coach was leaving. Mm -hmm. But then we got good news, as we know who the new head coach is going to be, and of all the people who could be picked to be the new head coach of the Michigan Wolverines, Sharon Moore, what a great pick. What a great pick. Now, more importantly, the coach that is staying, that I think makes all the difference in the world for the University of Michigan football team, is the strength and conditioning coach. This guy, he, he Jim Harbaugh, the former head coach, said this guy made all the difference in the world. That was good news to me. My son and I went, oh, Jim Harbaugh's leaving. Oh, oh, Jerome Ward is staying. Oh, but when we heard the strength and conditioning school, we went, yes, that's good news, that's gospel, that's beautiful news for us Michigan fans. For the rest of you, you could care less. <laughs> Except when we beat you all up in football games. Then you go, oh, we should have that. But this is good news, this is the gospel. This is beautiful news. The forgiveness of your sins. You should come to church every week saying, I'm going to forget, uh, uh, ask for forgiveness and hear that forgiveness. As the pastor says, in the stead and by the command, in the authority of Christ, I say to you, your sins are forgiven. It's as if God is saying it himself. And that confession, more importantly, in the absolution. That when you hear that your sins are forgiven, it is as God himself is saying it. God using that voice, those words to say, your sins are forgiven, and you should all go, Whew, Amen. Thank the Lord. That's the good news that we have. That's what we hold on to uh, as well. Question 209. When my sins condemn me and I'm doubting, how can I be sure of my forgiveness and salvation? I cannot really, you know, rely on my own by myself, but it has to come outside of me. I have to be reminded again and again and again. That's why you come to church. That's why the pastor stands up there and says, by the authority of Jesus, I tell you your sins are forgiven. They are forgiven. Done. You don't have to worry about them anymore. It is true. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it anymore with that. Now, there are other things that God places in our lives as well, symbols, I'd like to say, that help us to remember that our sins are forgiven. One of them is right here. What's this? You can look at the cross. What happened on the cross? Jesus died on the cross for you. Your forgiveness was one here with that. Today, I gave to Jacob and Jackson this thing. It had words on it. And I signed it. What did I give to them? No. A certificate. A certificate. A certificate. Martin Luther said every Christian should have in their bedroom or in plain sight of their eyes a cross hanging on the wall and their baptismal certificate. For our children, we put them in picture frames and we, we hung them in their bedrooms. In fact, um, when my daughter moved away <coughs> and she got her full-time job, adult job, guess what we took to her? That was hanging in her bedroom wall, her certificate, baptismal certificate and her cross. And she does hanging, she has it hanging up in her bedroom in her apartment right now. Every time we would go, when they were younger, we would go to bed. We would go in and do prayers. And the last thing I would say to them, I want you to know that I love you, but Jesus loves you most of all. And I would point to these things. Here it is. This is how much he loved you. He made you his child through the waters of holy baptism. That, 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 that's what's going on. So that it can be a constant reminder of that God loves me, forgives me, is always with me. Because Satan and his realm, the demon, would want us to doubt that. Always doubt that. Oh, yeah, it's too bad. You, you, you crossed the line with God. There's no way that God can forgive you. And I'm telling you, Jesus says, I already forgive you of that. I died for that sin. Don't think you're so bad that I can't save you. You're not that bad. 
You're not that bad. You're not that good at being bad either. That doesn't mean we go and sin whenever we want. But God offers forgiveness. Let her be right. I can be sure of Jesus because of what he did in the cross, as I said before. Every time you look at the cross, you can be assured, oh, this is how much Jesus loved me, how much God the Father loved me, how much the Holy Spirit loved me. Um, and, and with that. And then let her see... You know, I can be sure. Now, one of the things that we can do in the church, we have this. We're going to continue to hear what Jesus has to say. Sin's forgiven. You have to get to eternal life and salvation. We gather around with God's people. And they encourage us. They remind us what's God has done. This thing, the Lord's Supper. We say, receive, eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins, for the encouragement and strengthening of your faith. Every I it just I don't understand why people get confirmed and yet we never see them again. Why would you not want to be part of the thing that gives you strength in your faith? I don't get that. That doesn't make any sense. That's like saying, you know what? I'm done eating for now. How long would you last if you didn't eat ever again? For me, 45 minutes. <laughs> And then we pray. God wants us to come to him. He promises to hear our prayers. And Jesus prays with us. Prays for us and prays with us. Um, that we have that as well. So what a great comfort that is. And then 2.12, page 2.12. You know, I can be sure because God assures me in the scripture that he has chosen me in Christ out of pure grace to inherit eternal life. And that no one can snatch me out of his hands. That's the election of grace that God has called you. And he never goes back on his promise. Ever, 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 ever. I, you know, I've heard many, many, many sermons in my life. And I can probably just put up. But there may be about five of them that I will always remember. And one of them has to do with this. Um, uh, it was Pastor Stein, the congregation I was growing up at. And... He was talking about baptism. I will never forget this because he was talking to, to moms and dads whose children have not been in church. And he said, and obviously made an impression on me, they're baptized children of God. Not that you need to remind God of this, but remind God that they're a baptized child of God. And that, that he would never, ever um, leave them. And then... Pray that someone else, because when parents come and talk, children, but someone else would come and talk that they respect, that they would share the gospel with them again. And that happens many times. I do that now. I, I pray, send somebody, God, send somebody that that person would listen to, that they are reminded that they're a baptized child of God. Um, and that. And there have been many times, years after they've been confirmed, and I get the phone call, hey, pastor, this is so-and-so. Remember, you baptized me and you confirmed me. I said, I remember that. Where are you? What are you doing now? Oh, and then they, then they need to be assured that God loves them. I said, God always loves you. Then go to church? No. Well, go to church. Find a church. Come to Emmanuel. If you live here in town, come home. If not, I will help you find a church. I know lots of pastors, and they will love you, and they will share with you the good news, the gospel, that your sins are forgiven. And those things happen. So those things happen as well. All right, question 210. <coughs> uh, we must uh, firmly maintain this teaching of forgiveness, the doctrine of justification by faith for Christ's sake through faith. Why do we have to do that? Because that is the teaching. This is the, the, the bedrock, the foundation of all the other teachings is this thing called the gospel. That we have been declared righteous because of what Christ has done for us. For by, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God that does that. God does it solely. That we keep coming back to this. There are many churches who say, oh yeah, you're saved by Jesus and... Whenever you hear the word and, dude, red flags should go up. 
When someone says your salvation is contingent by you believing that Jesus is your Savior and being obedient. No! It's always you are saved because of Jesus, period. No more. Now, obedience, that's part of sanctification. Yes, because I love Jesus, because I've been saved by Jesus, and because I'm already saved, then I'm going to want to do things that Jesus wants me to do. Of course. Of course. But don't confuse sanctification, how we live the Christian life, with justification, how we have been declared righteous before God. Don't get the two mixed up. It's always justification first. You have been justified. You have been declared righteous because of what Jesus did for you. Now, we live sanctified lives. The Holy Spirit lives in and through us so that we do the things that are pleasing to God, that God wants us to be doing, and that we continue to do that. All right, question uh, 211. I don't think I'm going to get through this whole thing. That's all right. Um, where can I find the church uh, in the world? How do I recognize the church? As I mentioned before, what are the marks here and the means of grace? Do they preach the gospel? Do they teach you the gospel? That you're saved by God's grace? Yes, the law is always there. Because without the law, I can't get the gospel. you got to get too convicted. Oh, how do I say I can't save myself. Oh, Jesus did that for me. And then, is there baptism the Lord's Supper? And in that, it's always God coming to us first. God has come to us. In your baptism. In your baptism, God came to you. He didn't come to God. God came to you. And he declared you righteous. In the Lord's Supper, he gives you his very body and blood for the forgiveness of all your sins. That you have that. So these are the marks. These are the signs. So I often say when people visit other churches, listen and ask yourself, what are they doing with Jesus? Is it the things I do or is it the things that Jesus has done for me? Now, it doesn't mean that I don't do things for Jesus. But the gospel is, for God so loved the world that gave his only son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that, for God so loved the world that whoever does all these things for me, for God, then they'll have eternal life. No. It's mere believing. And that is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God by the Holy Spirit. So we have the marks. What are some of the outward indications that the church is present? As we said before, <coughs> we have these things going on. Now there's some other marks too that we have, that there might be some suffering going on because you're God's people. <coughs> that happens, but that doesn't always mean that. Doesn't always mean that. Um, that, um, that, uh, that you have pastors who are preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God, um, and supporting all that, that these things are happening in the church. Now, what's the mission of the church here on earth? Question 214. Proclaim the forgiveness of sins for Jesus, preaching the word, ministering the sacraments. At Emmanuel, we're a united growing family of Christians, directly dedicated to furthering God's kingdom. And that's what it is. God's kingdom is this proclaiming of the gospel that the sacraments are there. Baptism, Lord's Supper. That we receive them, that we get them, um, that we do that. Now, what are some of the privileges and responsibilities? of being members of the church? Well, we should regularly receive the word of God, hear it, believe it, and also receive the sacraments. And you, and primarily in the fellowship, in the gathering together, that we do that. Now, there are some of our members who I go out and visit. They're homebound, because they can't make it to church for whatever reason. I will bring them the Lord's Supper. That happens. But guess what? They're hearing this. We are gathered together as God's people, we do this, and we pray. So it happens. It happens. Um, that uh, we can make that happen. Um, as it says, join a church. Make sure you're part of a church that you hear the gospel, what Christ has done for you. That when you leave the church service, it should be, oh, yes, Jesus did this for me. Um, and that, uh, with that. And then we need to be aware of false teachings of going on. Uh, when my kids were younger, and this is especially during the pandemic, we used to play on Sunday afternoons. Let's turn on the Christian television stations and listen to these preachers and find out how much her heresy they have. Which was funny for me because I didn't say anything. The children just went at it. Their favorite one was Joel Olstein. Mr. Smiling Preacher. 
And if you listen to Joel Osteen, this guy was never mentioned. How can you talk about being the church and you don't mention about Jesus? I mean, that was always some of those things. So, you know, that you should hear about Jesus, what he's done for you, what he continues to do for you, and, and that, that you make that happen as well. Um, and then letter D, we should tell others about Jesus. Yes, we should. Um, our lives should be a witness in our words and our actions so that people are drawn to us and say, why do you talk that way? Why, why do you act that way? You say, because I love Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus and what he's done for you as he done for me um, as well. Question 216, what are some of the responsibilities towards other Christians in church bodies? Well, obviously we continue to pray. We pray for all people, especially God's people, um, that they hear that. What about some church bodies who call themselves Christian but are not really Christian? Well, we pray that they would recognize the truth, that they would recognize who Jesus is and what he's, what they do, what he's done for them, and that they would come to their senses, I put it that way, come to their senses and follow the true gospel, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Um, and that we always live in the forgiveness of sins. We're ready to forgive. Now, forgiveness does not mean they get away with whatever. Forgiveness is, I'm not going to hurt you the way that you hurt me. There's always consequences to our sins. I've used this example many, many times. I'm driving down Green Street. I'm doing mighty 90 miles an hour, and the police officer pulls me over. I can say, I'm sorry all I want. I could ask for forgiveness. He goes, Pastor, I forgive you, but here. There's consequences to sins. There's earthly consequences to our sins. Might not be a speeding ticket, but there's always consequences. There's always a ripple effect that goes out. Both bad and good as well. Um, and so, but God is always quick to forgive. Always to say, I forgive your sins, I remember them no more. We should be quick to say, I forgive you, and not bring it up again. That's our part, because we know uh, that what's going on. And so in saying, you're right. I forgive you. I'm not going to hurt you the way that you hurt me. Now, there does come a point where if someone continuously sins against you the same sins, there's, there does come a point where you say, you know what? We need to separate because this is not working. It's not that I don't love you, not that I don't forgive you, but we can't be together. And that's where uh, I think that's all right. The world's a big place. And we can, you know, and, and things like that. So um, there is a time and place for that uh, as well, uh, that we have that. And then we look forward to the church triumphant uh, when we go home to heaven, uh, and that we have that as well. Okay? And then turn to page 222. To page 222. You know, this last part. Um, and this is what we look forward to. On the last day, meaning when Jesus comes again, uh, he will raise me in all the dead, give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. Uh, and we say this is most certainly true. We do look forward to that day when Jesus comes again and will take us all home together. We look forward to that. But until that time, we have to wait. We have to wait till that happens. Um, and, um, and we say that. Now, as we say... On the last day, when Jesus comes, uh, he's going to raise all the dead. Everybody's going to be raised. All the way from Adam and Eve till when Jesus gets there. And, as we say, and God will give to those who believe in him <coughs> heaven. And those who do not believe in him and trust in him and therefore their salvation, he will send, they will send themselves to hell. I'll put it that way. Because they made that choice. Chose not to believe in Jesus as your Savior. You made that choice. God didn't make that choice for you. Um, and so um, we have that. So everybody will be raised. And on the last day, all those believers in Christ will go home to heaven. And they'll be reunited with their uh, spiritual bodies so that you'll have a new body without sin. I have no idea what that's going to look like. I'm looking forward to that day. 
You'll see what that is all about. And everybody's walking around with lion's horns. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you know. Now, question 222, so page 224. Why do people die? The wages of sin is death. People die because of sin. They might die of other causes, whatever that is, but people, every person dies because of sin. Every funeral I do, ah, we're seeing the result of sin right here. I don't care how good that person may have been in on earth, but that person was still a sinner. That person died. Here's the result of sin. There it is. So that, uh, with that. Now, when we die, our souls goes to be with Jesus. Our earthly remains remain here. And like I said, on the last day, God raises our bodies. They become like his glorious body. And our souls are reunited and we're with Jesus forever in heaven uh, if we believe. And if not, then you spend eternity in hell. So you have this going on. So our souls are in Jesus. Earthly remains are still here. And um, we have that. Now, we as a church, often we say that those who die in the Lord have fallen asleep in him. We, we use that phrase. And that's true. That's true. We do. Paul mentions it. We fall asleep in the Lord. And on the last day, we'll get waken up. And the book of Revelation and other places, book of Thessalonians, talk about there will be the last trumpet that will sound. Mm. Quite the alarm. Yeah. Um, with that. So um, we had that. I believe that the song that will be played on the last day when Jesus comes again is Hail to the Victors. Now, if you don't know that, that's Michigan's fight song. What do you think? Hail. Was something with Michigan. I know, I had to work in it. Hail to the Victors, Valiant. Hail to the Conquering Heroes. Hail, hail to Jesus' children. That's what we are. Um, you know, and that we look forward to that day when we will be with Jesus forever. In heaven, and and all those who believe him, our family members will all be there. Now, I often get asked this question: Will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? And I'll say, we will see our loved ones the way that God always saw them, without sin. Now, can you imagine looking at your loved ones and imagine and seeing them without sin? I have no idea what that would look like. But everything we happens to us is a result of sin. So I always picture this. You're going to get to heaven, and wives, you're going to look at your husbands and say, wow, you're like really, really good looking. Wow, man, you look awesome. And everyone will. Everyone will because you will be without sin. That's why I think we're all walking around with name tags on, just in case. And not just any name tags. This, this will be a throwback AAL name tags. Father lunge to sell. Not just thriving. A A L. I've really dated myself with that, didn't I? Yeah. But we will we will have that and we'll enjoy that. My uh, my uh, my wife and I have told our children that when they get to heaven, look for mom in the choir, and then look for dad standing next to Luther by the beer keg. <laughs> or food or whatever the carrying obviously a lion's mark um, that we that we have that so um, now what will happen to everything here on earth um, the book of Revelation says, tells us there will be a new heaven there will be a new earth so this will all go away there will be new heavens and new earth and I have no idea what that means but when it comes to that point then God will reveal that to all of us um, so we have that. And then the other thing is, we don't know when the last day is happening. Only God knows. Jesus even said what he said. I don't even know when the last day is happening. I don't know when this is all taking place. Now, when does Pastor Stucker and I think Jesus is going to come again? When he decides to. When? <laughs> when he decides to. No, but what do we jokingly say? When the Lions, with two seconds left, are going to win the Super Bowl, and Jesus is going to come again, and we're both going to go, 
You couldn't wait two seconds for us to enjoy this for a moment, that this team that had never won anything, it's finally won a Super Bowl. No, I don't know. It's not going to happen then. I can rest assured that probably is not going to happen on that day. But I do know this. We're always one day closer. Always one day closer. Every generation believes that this is it. You should. You should. You should always be ready for the coming of Jesus because you never know when it's going to happen. Never, ever. We don't know what it is. I always enjoy these people who try to, oh, it's going to happen on such and such a day. No, I can rest assured it's not going to happen on such and such a day. Oh, it's going to happen on such and such a month. No, probably not. Year, probably not. Um, with that. But we always need to be ready because you never know. You never know when that's going to happen. Now, do I pray that Jesus would come sooner than later? All the time. All the time. Okay, Lord, it's getting pretty bad here on earth. It's pretty bad here in the world with that. And then I remind myself that when my grandparents were alive, they thought that was bad. And I'm sitting there going, oh, they, they ain't seen nothing yet. That was that what they went through, what we're going through. And of course, if I live long enough to see my grandchildren grow up and they have children, they're probably going to go, oh, I remember when Grandpa used to say that it can't get any worse. And oh, guess what? It's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. But... God has promised that he will always watch over us. He will always protect us. And on the last day, he will take us home to be with him in heaven. Now, there are some things that are very confusing with that when Jesus will come again. We believe that we are living in the last days now. When Jesus ascended into heaven, began the end times. So we've been living in them for 2,000 years. Some will read the book of Revelation and get very confused about this thousand-year reign that Jesus will come uh, before the tribulation starts. And then, no, Jesus might come when it's halfway through the tribulation. Oh, wait a minute, Jesus will come again when the tribulation ends. And very confusing part. We just said, we just said, we're living in the last days, the last times. Yes, we live, we're living through the tribulation. Right now, when Jesus ascended in heaven, it started. And it will be with us until Jesus comes again. Until Jesus comes again. Uh, in your catechism, on pages 229 and, and uh, following, actually just page 229, um, talks about these different views of what other churches believe. All we need, all I want you to know, is that we're living in the last days now, and Jesus will come again on the, and the last day. And we look forward to that. And we can pray for that. We can pray that he would come sooner than later. Um, and like I said, every day we're a day closer to him coming again. And we look forward to that. Now, I just pray that if he does decide to come with two seconds left in the Super Bowl and the Lions are winning, that he would just wait five seconds. No, I didn't do that. Because <laughs> nothing would be greater than being with Jesus in heaven. Even better than winning the Super Bowl. Well, I'll find out this year if that happens. But that's what I'm All right? Questions, comments? I get it. What the hell? What? Oh. Oh, she did. All right. Pastor Hooper will be back next week, uh, and he'll start the uh, worst prayer. Okay. Have a great day.